Our upcoming experiment in Chem 1212 is titled Solubility, Equilibria, and Temperature. And this experiment also includes a component of periodic trends. The overarching goal of the experiment is to measure the solubility product constant, or KSP, for a series of group 2 metal hydroxides dissolving in water, specifically magnesium, calcium, and strontium hydroxides. We're also going to measure KSP for these metal hydroxides at various temperatures. And so you and your lab partner will investigate only one of the three, and then you'll pool your data with the rest of your section to get the periodic trends, to, to see whether there is a periodic trend in KSP at a given temperature for a series of metal hydroxides with the metal in group two. What we get from the dependence of KSP on temperature is a sense of the thermodynamics of the dissolution and precipitation processes. Specifically, we can determine values for delta H, the standard enthalpy change of dissolution, and delta S, the standard entropy change of dissolution from this data. And that gives us insight into whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic and what the entropic change is. We can make predictions of the signs of these values in particular based on the reactants and products in the balanced chemical equation. And we'll see whether those predictions are borne out in our measurements. Let's begin by reviewing a little bit about dissolution, precipitation, equilibria, and KSP in the particular context of these group two metal hydroxides, MOH2. So let's first write a balanced chemical equation for the dissolution and precipitation processes. So dissolution is the forward direction. The solid metal hydroxide dissolves to form aqueous metal cations, M2+, and hydroxide anions, OH-. The reverse direction is called precipitation, since this is the formation of the solid from the aqueous ions. The three metal cations we're going to investigate in this experiment are Mg2+, Ca2+, and Sr2+, and these are all group 2 or alkaline earth metal elements. Now, the equilibrium constant for this process, you've probably seen before, it is Ksp, or the solubility product constant. And Ksp has the form of any equilibrium constant with product concentrations divided by reactant concentrations at equilibrium equal to Ksp. But interestingly, in this reaction, because the reactants are purely solid, there is no concentration term in the denominator. There's a one there because of the solid metal hydroxide on the left-hand side. Note also the two in the exponent for hydroxide because of the two in the balanced chemical equation for this dissolution precipitation equilibrium. That squared term is gonna become important as we do calculations with KSP. Now, in practice, to think about KSP, we need to think about a saturated solution of the metal hydroxide in water. So we're gonna dissolve up our metal hydroxides in water with excess solid present so that the dissolution and precipitation processes are both happening inside the solution on the surface of the solid. And so at equilibrium, we'll have equal rates of the ions joining the solid and precipitating and leaving the solid to form dissolved ions. And the solution will be saturated in the metal hydroxide, meaning it will have the maximum amounts of M2 plus and OH minus dissolved based on the value of KSP and the thermodynamics of the process. KSP is useful as an equilibrium constant, but a more kind of laboratory-friendly intuitive number is the molar solubility. How many moles of MOH2 can we dissolve in a liter of solution? And this is the maximum concentration of MOH2 that we can have in the aqueous solution. This is often denoted with the letter X. Now, X has some relations to these concentrations of cations and anions in the solution just based on simple stoichiometry. So MOH2 contains one M2 plus cation. So the concentration of M2 plus is equal to the molar solubility. On the other hand, each MOH2 molecule contains two hydroxide ions. So the concentration of dissolved hydroxide in the saturated solution is twice the molar solubility, or 2x. And these, of course, are both equilibrium concentrations of M2 plus and OH minus, where we have the saturated solution with dissolution and precipitation happening with equal rates. At this point now, we can write an expression for KSP in terms of the molar solubility by substituting in these X expressions for the concentration expressions we wrote above. And what we end up with is X times the quantity 2X squared, or simplifying things out, 4X cubed. This relates the molar solubility of MOH2 X to the value of KSP. To actually measure 
Ksp, we need to measure one of these concentrations, M2 plus or OH minus, and then apply the stoichiometry idea to determine the other concentration. We are going to measure the OH minus concentration through acid-base titration. So first, we're going to take a portion of the saturated solution, filter off the excess solids so that all we're left with is dissolved ions in the resulting solution, and then we're going to titrate that portion with acid. From this, we'll determine the equilibrium hydroxide concentration, use stoichiometry to determine the equilibrium M2 plus concentration, and determine Ksp from there. And here shortly, we'll look at this process in detail. Now let's talk a little bit more about the operational aspects of the titration and how we're going to go from the titration data to a value for Ksp. So we're going to set this up as we would any titration with a burette and an Erlenmeyer flask. Our analyte in the Erlenmeyer flask will be the saturated MOH2 solution, and our titrant in the burette will be a solution of hydrochloric acid in water with a concentration of 0 0.0020 mole per liter of HCl or H3O plus equivalently. We don't yet know the concentration of MOH2 in the analyte, and that's the entire goal of the titration to determine that concentration. What we do know is how the OH- minus in that saturated solution reacts with the H3O plus supplied by the hydrochloric acid. They react in a one-to-one -one ratio to form two equivalents of H2O. In order to see when this reaction has run its course, when we've just added enough H3O plus to consume all of the OH-, minus, we're going to add phenylphthalein indicator to the analyte solution, and this will turn the solution bright pink at the start of the titration. At the end of the titration, the color will disappear, the solution will go colorless, and we will know we've added just enough acid to consume the hydroxide. The key piece of data that comes out of this is the volume of HCl, or titrant solution, that we added to proceed from the beginning of the titration to the end point. And this will generally be on the order of a few milliliters. Another piece of information that's very important for us to know and use is the starting volume of the analyte solution, VMOH2. As an important experimental note, this will vary by metal because the solubilities of these metal hydroxides vary massively, and so more solution will be required for some metal hydroxides and less for others. Ultimately, what we want to know is the moles of hydroxide per liter of analyte solution. And to get there, we need to start with the number of moles of hydroxide implied by our titration result. We know from the stoichiometry of the titration reaction, OH- reacting with H3O+, that these react in a one-to-one -one ratio. This means that the number of moles of H3O+, that we added via the HCl solution, is equal to the number of moles of OH- in the starting analyte solution. NOH- equals NH3O+. And NH3O+, plus we can calculate using simple stu solution stoichiometry. We had a solution of 0 0.0020 molar HCl. Multiplying that by the volume of HCl we added tells us the moles of HCl and the moles of H3O+, plus equivalently, that we added. And this is equal to the moles of hydroxide present in the analyte solution. The concentration of that hydroxide is simply that number of moles divided by our starting volume of the saturated metal hydroxide solution, VMOH2. This is one of the two concentrations that goes into the KSP expression. The other is the metal cation concentration, M2+. And actually, now that we know what the hydroxide concentration is, it's simply a matter of the stoichiometry of the metal hydroxide to determine the concentration of M2+. We know that the concentration of M2+, is half the concentration of hydroxide in the saturated solution because of the 1 to 2 stoichiometry of the metal cation and hydroxide in the metal hydroxide salt. And so with that in hand, we can simply apply the equilibrium expression for Ksp to determine its value. And just as a bit of a practical note, you may see P Ksp in various places. This is simply the negative base 10 logarithm of Ksp, and it provides a bit of a more human-friendly number, since Ksp is generally going to be a very small number with a 10 to the negative something exponent as a result of the sparing solubility of these metal hydroxide salts. So to summarize, we started with an analyte solution at a known volume, VMOH2, we're going to titrate using some volume of HCl to the end point. We're going to use the relation between hydroxide and hydronium number of moles to determine that hydroxide number of moles, calculate its concentration, 
use stoichiometry of MOH2 to calculate the metal cation concentration and then plug those in to the KSP equilibrium expression to calculate KSP. In the lab, different lab groups are going to use different metal salts to determine KSP for the various metal hydroxides at room temperature and then at two elevated temperatures. On the next slide, we'll talk about how to think about the relationship between KSP and temperature and relate that to thermodynamics. We're going to finish off by discussing the relationship between KSP and the absolute or Kelvin temperature and how we can reason from the temperature dependence of KSP to the thermodynamic parameters of the dissolution and precipitation reactions, delta H and delta S. And to do this, let's begin with this equilibrium chemical equation we've been working with for the dissolution of our metal hydroxides. We know that the equilibrium constant for this process is KSP, and KSP is intimately related to the thermodynamics of the reaction, specifically the free energy change, delta G, the enthalpy change, delta H, and the entropy change, delta S. And to understand how these are related, we need to lay down a few equations. So the first one I'm going to lay down is the definition of free energy in terms of enthalpy and entropy. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And the little circle, by the way, means under standard conditions. These changes in thermodynamic free energies starting from standard conditions. The other equation I'm going to write down is the law of mass action, which relates delta G to the equilibrium constant. I won't go through a derivation of this, but this is a very important equation because it helps us understand the thermodynamic origins of the equilibrium constant. Delta G is equal to negative RT times the natural log of K, which in this case is KSP. Now, by combining these two equations, specifically their right-hand sides, setting those equal to each other, we can arrive at an equation that relates temperature and KSP, and also includes delta H and delta S. Specifically, the natural log of KSP is equal to negative delta H divided by R times 1 over T plus delta S over R. And in this equation, by the way, R is the ideal gas constant. For example, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, although you could use any units of the gas constant in this equation, joules are most common. We'll have measurements of KSP as a function of temperature for the various metal hydroxides. What can this tell us? Well, let's dig into this equation a little bit. Notice that the natural log of KSP should be related in a linear way to 1 over the temperature, since we can imagine what's underlined in yellow as a y variable and what's underlined in green as an x variable, with the slope equal to the thing multiplying 1 over temperature and the y-intercept equal to the added term, plus delta S over R. So if, for example, we were to plot the yellow and green variables, specifically the natural log of KSP on the y-axis and the inverse temperature on the x-axis, we should expect a linear fit here. We should expect the data to fall on a line, and we can add a line of best fit to see whether that happens. In the lab, we're going to make measurements at approximately 80 degrees C. That corresponds to 1 over 353 Kelvin, approximately 40 degrees C, 1 over 313 Kelvin, and approximately 20 degrees C, or 1 over 293 Kelvin. The data we should expect to see should be linear, with potentially increasing or decreasing natural log of KSP in moving from left to right. Here I'm drawing an upward sloping line, but as we'll see later, a downward sloping line is not unexpected. Either could be observed on this plot. And in fact, the y-intercept could be greater than or less than zero. In the line I'm drawing here, the y-intercept is greater than zero, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. It all depends on what your data is telling you and the signs of delta H and delta S, which we don't know. That's the whole point of doing this experiment so that we can determine those values. Now, let's dig into this line a little bit. First, let's talk about the slope. What is the slope of this line? Well, theoretically, it's the thing that multiplies 1 over temperature on the right-hand side of this equation, specifically negative delta H divided by R. Thus, the slope gives us a measure of the enthalpy change. We can take that slope, multiply it by negative R, and obtain the standard enthalpy change of the reaction from there. We can also get information from the y-intercept. What happens when 1 over t goes to 0? Well, the entire first term drops out, and we see the natural log of Ksp is equal to delta S over R. So the y-intercept gives us information about the entropy change of the reaction. And to determine the standard entropy change, all we need to do is multiply that y-intercept 
by R. And because entropy is typically reported in units of, for example, joules per Kelvin mole, using R with units of 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole is highly convenient here. Ditto with the enthalpy. Enthalpy is typically in joules or kilojoules per mole, so using 8.314 makes a lot of sense there in dealing with the slope as well. Now what can this tell us? Well, qualitatively, let's talk about what we can get from this graph. In the example shown here, the slope is positive. What this means is that the delta H must be negative to ensure that negative 1 times delta H comes out to a positive number. This tells us that the reaction is exothermic. Delta H is less than 0. Delta H is negative. The y-intercept gives us information about the entropy change of the reaction, specifically because we're stipulating here that the y-intercept is positive. You may see positive or negative in the actual lab there is an increase in the entropy of the system when this reaction occurs from standard conditions. That's not so surprising for a dissolution reaction where we're going from a relatively ordered solid to relatively disordered aqueous ions, but you may see it either way in general. So what we've just seen is that measuring the temperature dependence of the equilibrium constant provides a method for measuring delta H and delta S for any chemical reaction, not just dissolution and precipitation. In the case of dissolution and precipitation, though, we can make some guesses about the signs of enthalpy and entropy, and I encourage you to think about those on your own before you get into the lab and use those to calibrate your expectations for how KSP will change as we adjust the temperature.